Welcome to the I Disciple Philippines Conference. It's a privilege uh, to be a part of it. And my session this morning has to do with a biblical view of shepherding. And um, to form that biblical view of shepherding, we're going to be looking at two key passages of Scripture written by the Apostle Paul. And in those passages, we see his pastoral heart, but we also see his desire and goal for believers under his care to be brought to maturity in Christ. And so let's begin in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he, that is Jesus, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ." from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Authentic biblical shepherding exists as the normal function of a healthy body of believers who are being intentionally equipped by spirit-gifted men so that each member may carry out his or her God-appointed role in the work of building up the whole church. God's vision of discipleship, therefore, requires that pastors lead the work by faithfully teaching the word for the purpose of equipping believers to serve the Lord within the body of Christ so that they will learn to live godly lives, uh, that they will reflect the holiness of God, uh, but that also then they will be able to come alongside one another to counsel one another, disciple one another toward the holiness that God desires in our lives. So we have to be committed to understanding what biblical church growth looks like. And that's what we have pictured here in this passage of Scripture. There is a key role that is defined here in this passage, and it has to do with pastors. And that's the key role that we're going to focus on in this session. The word pastor means shepherd. It's found throughout the Scriptures for example, in Isaiah 40, verse 11, it says that God, like a shepherd, will tend his flock. Also in the New Testament, in John chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as being the good shepherd. So this picture of a shepherd who cares for his flock and leads and protects and teaches his flock is found throughout the scriptures. There's also a negative example of shepherds in the New Testament, excuse me, in the Old Testament, um, I direct your attention at some point on your own to work through the book of Jeremiah and just pay attention to all that God says in the book of Jeremiah concerning shepherds. Really, the book of Jeremiah is an essay on apostasy in Israel. And specifically, Jeremiah many times calls out the failure of spiritual shepherds. For example, in chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, he says that the shepherds did not even know God. So imagine that. The shepherds of God's people did not even know the Lord. They, in chapter 5, rejected the authority of God's word. Chapter 6, it says they no longer delighted in the word of God, but instead they were greedy for material gain. They offered God's people false forms of healing. And as a result, then, they brought God's judgment on the nation. 
in contrast, in the New Testament specifically, in the book of First Peter in chapter 5, shepherds or pastors or elders are called to shepherd the church of God very carefully, to do it uh, with God's vision and God's heart. And so as we look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, thinking about the role primarily of church shepherds, I want you to notice, first of all, the provision for growth, which is found in verse 11. And he, that is Jesus, gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Apostles here, uh, the word means one who is sent on a mission. It is not meant that God gave some of the gifts needed to constitute these people to be apostles, but that is true, that they were gifted by God, but that God qualified some to be apostles and then gave them to the church. And in the New Testament, then, we come to the understanding that the apostles were the foundation builders for the church. Then it says that Jesus gave prophets to the church. Uh, the word prophet itself refers to those who foretold the future, but in this context, it has to do with those who forthrightly preached messages from God. So the word literally means one who speaks forth or speaks openly. And according to Hebrews chapter 1, in the first two verses, it says that God, after he spoke long ago through prophets, has now spoken through his Son. And so Jesus Christ, the very revelation of God, God in the flesh, is the final message from God. So the living word of God, Jesus Christ, gave to us his written word, which is now the functional authority for the church. And that's why throughout the New Testament epistles, primarily First and Second Timothy and Titus, we find this repetition of the call to church leaders to guard the truth. Then he goes on to mention evangelists. Evangelists uh, are those who proclaimed the gospel which they had received from the apostle. Many times the word in the New Testament it refers to a, a missionary who brings the gospel into a new region. And so this term often refers to missionaries and church planters. And then finally, some were given as pastors and teachers. So this compound word refers to those who are shepherds, but the way that they shepherd is through the teaching. Together, the two terms literally mean teaching shepherds. John Stott says this, if today's pastors were to take seriously the New Testament emphasis on the priority of preaching and teaching, not only would they find it extremely fulfilling themselves, but also it would undoubtedly have a very wholesome effect on the church. Instead, tragic to relate, many are essentially administrators whose symbols of ministry are the office rather than the study and the telephone rather than the Bible. And so Paul calls pastors to be shepherds, to be uh, primarily carrying out their shepherding role through the teaching of the Word of God. Kenneth Wiest, the Greek scholar um, of years back, says that this term refers to God's ideal pastor as being one who engages in a teaching ministry, feeding the saints on expository preaching, giving them the rich food of the Word of God. So essential to biblical church growth is the ongoing teaching of the Word of God. And so uh, God has given this provision to the church through spiritually gifted men. But then secondly, I want you to see the progression of growth in verse 12. Jesus has given gifted men to the church for 
the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So teaching shepherds are to use the gifts that God gives to them to open the word of God to God's people so that they understand the word of God, they obey the word of God, but also that they be equipped to carry out the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And so there is this progression that starts with equipping. The word is used in Matthew 4.21 in, in reference to preparing fishing nets. And in Galatians chapter 6, 1, it's used in a medical way. Uh, it, it is a medical term that refers to the setting of a bone. And so there in Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul is calling those who are spiritual to come alongside and restore struggling brothers and sisters to a walk of faithfulness and holiness in the Lord. But these this is to be done gently with meekness. So there is this equipping uh, responsibility that teaching shepherds have. Uh, Richard Baxter reminded his fellow pastors in this way, a minister is not to be merely a public preacher, but to be known as a counselor for their souls, as the physician is for their bodies and the lawyer for their estates, so that each man who is in doubt and dire straits may bring his case to him for resolution, as Nicodemus came to Christ, and as it was usual with the people of old to go to the priest, as the people have become unacquainted with this office of the ministry and with their own duty and necessity in this respect. It belongs to us to acquaint them with it, and to publicly press them to come to us for advice about the great concerns of their souls. We must not only be willing to take the trouble, but should draw it upon ourselves by inviting them to come. What abundance of good might we do could we but bring them to this? One word of seasonable, prudent advice given by a minister to persons in need may be of more use than many sermons. So Baxter's point is that teaching shepherds not only carry on their ministry from the pulpit in public teaching, but there is also this personal ministry of the word, this discipleship, this shepherding, this uh, biblical counseling that uh, equips believers to grow in their relationship with the Lord. Paul then says this equipping leads to service. The equipping is for the work of service. Uh, this word service is related to the word from which we get deacon. It simply means to serve. And of the 35 times that the word is used in the New Testament, only five of those times does it refer to an, an official church office of deacon. Every other time, it refers to every person in the body of Christ to be a minister, to be a servant, to carry out the one another's that we find in the New Testament. And there are so many of these one another commands, just a few of them. Be devoted to one another. Accept one another by, by withholding judgment. Build up one another, serve one another, be gentle with one another, live in peace with one another. And it goes on and on. And as teaching shepherds, if we can teach our people to not just hear the word of God in public sermons, but also to apply it in the body life of the church, in loving one another and carrying out these uh, ministries, the church will grow toward maturity. And that, Paul says, is the goal uh, to the building up of the body of Christ. That's the third part of this progression. Building up is a compound word from the word house and to build. So to build a house. It's the word from which we get uh, the word edify. So 
it, it carries with it the, the New Testament idea of spiritual edification and the promotion of spiritual growth. So this is the progression of growth that we see. Then we see the purpose of growth in verse 13, and that is until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So the purpose is spiritual maturity. That we would come to the goal of being like Christ. To the unity of the faith, Paul says. The faith in the New Testament is a reference to the whole body of truth that is revealed in the Scriptures. And so we need to understand that true church growth looks like growth toward maturity. When the members of the church are growing toward maturity in their walk with Christ and a life of holiness, that that uh, genuine church growth is taking place. We need to understand from this phrase, the unity of the faith, that true Christian unity is not based upon all of us having the same personal convictions, but it refers to us uniting around the fundamental truths of the Scriptures and considering those to be most important. And Paul says this unity requires a mutual knowledge of the Son of God. And so as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, we are also growing in the unity of the faith. This then leads to us becoming mature. He says in verse 13, to a mature man. This refers to someone who is complete, someone who is fully grown, someone who has reached the goal that, uh, that has been set. The writer of Hebrews um, unfortunately lamented that some of the believers he was writing to had not grown toward maturity. He says, for by this time you ought to be teachers, but you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes, partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So every one of us, when we come to faith in Christ, we come as a spiritual baby, as a spiritual infant. But God doesn't want us to stay that way. He wants us to grow toward maturity, to be able to handle the Word of God, and then to be able to, to, to discern uh, truth from error. This then leads to the measure of the stature of Christ. This just repeats the... Uh, the previous idea of being full-grown. In other words, what does spiritual maturity look like? What does a full-grown Christian look like? It looks like Christ. So biblical sanctification is not becoming a carbon copy of another Christian, but it is to mimic the fullness of Christ. All that he is, his virtues, his holiness, his love. And so you find in the scriptures, Paul regularly pleading with God to produce in his disciples the knowledge of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. In other words, to know by experience the love of Christ, which, which surpasses simple knowledge, so that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And this is really reflected in God's goal for the believer as stated in Romans 8 and verse 29. God's goal for every believer is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. That then leads to verses 14 and 15 to the proof of growth. And Paul refers to two qualities that are evidence of spiritual growth. The first is doctrinal stability. He says that as a result, we are no longer to be children. 
tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. We are no longer to be infants at the mercy of error. We are no longer to be spiritual babies who then find ourselves susceptible to uh, the craftiness of false teachers. He refers here to the trickery of men. William Hendrickson writes in his commentary, the term trickery applied to those who in effect were attempting to lead believers astray. Paul is thinking, therefore, of dice playing in which tricks were used in order to win. Hence, the word came to mean trickery. Here, human trickery. So, this is someone who is ready to do anything for deceitful scheming. And so, we need to understand that the devil is wanting to Uh, use deceitful scheming to lead the people in our churches astray. And we need to teach the word of God faithfully as shepherds so that they will become firmly grounded in the word of God so that they will then be able to discern truth from error. That then will lead to another quality, uh, which is a faithful testimony. This phrase, speaking the truth in love, is a present tense participle, which means it's referring to something that is a continuous action and could be translated truthing in love. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this about that phrase, what the expression conveys is that we are in the truth, that we are walking in the truth. Perhaps the best translation of all, he says, would be having or holding the truth in love. That, of course, includes speaking it and discussing it together and teaching it. But it is not merely speaking. It covers the whole of our deportment, that is, how we carry ourselves. We are to be true and to walk in the truth and in love. So this is one of the marks of Christ-likeness or spiritual maturity that Paul uh, refers to here in Ephesians. And then finally notice in verse 16 the power for growth. And this is so encouraging that the power for spiritual growth toward maturing is the same power that we rely upon for our ministries. And that is the power of God, the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice Uh, how Paul words it in verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so it is Christ who is the head of the church who supplies the power for genuine church growth. From whom the whole body receives its energy is from Christ by means of the Spirit of Christ. And and we are being fitted and held together. That is, God is building in us a framework which then is a functioning organism, a body. The church is not an organization. The church is a functioning organism, a living, breathing body of Christ. And so uh, the, the point here in verse 16 is that Jesus is the sovereign designer and builder of the church. We are the ligaments and the muscles. And as, as we work according to God's plan in the church, we are every joint that is supplying the proper working of each individual part. That is in the end, is what causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so this should remind us of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and that is that we all have a responsibility toward the building up of the church in love. That, That the goal of church growth 
is not numbers. The goal of church growth is spiritual maturity in Christ. That is, that is the Apostle Paul's picture of what church growth looks like and what our role is in that as teaching shepherds. Now, I want to build on that goal by going to our second passage of Scripture, which is Colossians chapter 1. And here we see uh, the commitment of the Apostle to always be working toward maturing believers in Jesus Christ. We understand from Ephesians 4 that that is the goal of genuine church growth, that the role of teaching shepherds is to be working toward the maturity of believers in Christ. And so we have to be committed to Christ-centered ministry that continually builds believers on the solid foundation of Christ and his wisdom. And that is described here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29, where Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister, according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. We here see the apostles' commitment to build the church upon the wisdom of Christ. In order to accomplish this, he knew that he had to rely upon the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. And, and the same is true of us. So as we struggle toward the goal of being conformed to the image of Christ ourselves, but also then to be a part of the process of God conforming other believers to the image of Christ, we need to rely upon the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. So let's think now about this, this authentic ministry that, that the Apostle describes here in these verses in Colossians chapter 1. Notice, first of all, the price of authentic ministry, which is a willingness to suffer. In verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings, not because the suffering itself is fun, but I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That is, I rejoice in the way that God uses my sufferings not only to refine and develop my own faith, but also to refine and develop your faith. This refers to the need for us to get involved in other people's lives, to share uh, what God is teaching us through our own suffering uh, so that others grow in Christ as well. In the book Rediscovering Pastoral Ministry, Lance Quinn makes a case for this kind of personal ministry of the Word. He says, Our role as pastors demands that we be disciple makers. We cannot be pulpiteers who preach at our people but have no involvement in their lives. The process only begins with the proclamation of Scripture. It finds its real fruition across the entire spectrum of the shepherd's work, feeding, leading, cleaning, bandaging, protecting, nurturing, and every other aspect of a tender 
shepherd's loving care. This is the process of discipling. And so as you read this passage, you can see the heart of the apostle in wanting to see Christ formed in those whom he was serving. But he says very clearly that part of that process involves uh, a willingness to pay the price of suffering. And he says that suffering empowers our ministry in at least three ways. That suffering leads to deeper, more lasting growth. I mean, think about uh, the Apostle Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. Jesus made it very clear that suffering was going to be part of God's calling upon Paul's life and upon his ministry. He says, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, the word lacking there does not mean that the sufferings of Christ are insufficient for salvation, but rather that there is much more suffering that needs to take place so that the gospel is taken to the ends of the earth and, and the love and the grace and the mercy of Christ are seen through his servants who are willing to suffer. John Piper explains it this way in his book on missions. He says this phrase refers to uh, Paul being willing to suffer Christ's afflictions. He says Christ's afflictions are not lacking in their atoning sufficiency. They are lacking in that they are not known and felt by people who are not at the cross. Paul dedicates himself not only to carry the message of those sufferings to the nations, but also to suffer with Christ and for Christ in such a way that what people see are Christ's sufferings. In this way, he follows the pattern of Christ by laying down his life for the life of the church. He says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus with its eternal glory. So suffering leads to deeper, more lasting growth. Suffering uh, takes the gospel to places where it would not otherwise go. Suffering helps us to comfort others as well. I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and how uh, pa, the Apostle Paul calls God the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we will be able then to comfort others. It is through suffering that God develops Christ-like character in our lives and it is through suffering that God opens doors of ministry to other people who need the comfort and the grace of God. Suffering also keeps us from exalting ourselves. I mean, remember what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The very reason why God allowed Satan to give Paul his thorn in the flesh was so that Paul would be kept from exalting himself. God knew that pride was the biggest hindrance to the effectiveness of Paul's ministry. And so God gave Paul this thorn in the flesh to humble him and to keep him humble. We need to understand that God does so much in our lives through suffering and he does work in other people's lives through our suffering on their behalf. Charles Spurgeon recognized this. He said, Our God takes care always to have security, that if he works a great work by us, we shall not appropriate the glory of it to ourselves. He brings us down lower and lower in our own esteem. Some trumpets are so stuffed with self that God cannot blow through them. You may rest quite certain that if God honors a man in public, he takes him aside privately and flogs him well. Otherwise, he would get elevated and proud, and God will not have that. 
God so wants to use us for his glory that he is willing to cause us to suffer so that we will humble ourselves before him and the pride that is so naturally flowing from our hearts will be kept at bay and not do harm to ourselves, to our ministries, and to others. So there, there needs to be this price that is willing uh, to be paid for ministry, and the price is suffering. But then notice how the apostle describes the personality of this authentic ministry of developing believers in Christ. We see that it is a responsible uh, ministry or, or a responsible discipleship. He says, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. The word stewardship refers to a manager of a household, refers to the responsibility, authority, and obligation that is given to a household slave. So it carries with it the idea that God has given to us a responsibility a stewardship that we will one day give an account for. And when the Lord Jesus returns, we will have to give an account to him for this stewardship, uh, the, the responsibility that God has given to us as ministers of the gospel. Paul understood this, and that's why he carried the weight of the responsibility upon his shoulders as something that was very serious. It was a stewardship from God. Paul says, bestowed on me for your benefit. So that gives us another um, character quality of this ministry that it was, it was known by its servanthood. It was servant discipleship. Paul says it's for your benefit. Paul says, not for my benefit. But for your benefit, this stewardship has been given to me. This follows in the line of the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus himself washed the feet of his disciples. He laid out that example of servanthood, and then he said, says to us, you do the same. Our ministry, our shepherding, our pastoring should be characterized by servanthood. Paul says this ministry is also word-saturated. He says, uh, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. See, the chief substance of Paul's preaching was the word of God. And that must be the substance of our preaching and our teaching. He says in verse uh, 26 that the mystery which was hidden from past ages and generations has now been manifested to his saints. The word mystery in the New Testament re refers to something that was unknowable by common human means. Something that had to be revealed by God. So he's speaking of divine revelation. This word is used 22 times in the New Testament. It could almost be considered a Pauline term if it were not uh, used one time by Jesus in Mark 4 and four times uh, by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Paul is speaking here of the mystery of divine revelation, which is the word of God. And that is to be the substance of what he preached. This is the unity of the faith that we saw in Ephesians chapter 4. That, that body of apostolic doctrine, which now we have become stewards of. And this includes the gospel. This refers to the once hidden truth that is now revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this mystery that was hidden from the past ages has now been made manifest to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, verse 
27, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery. This is the divine revelation. This is the preaching of the word of God, that in the gospel, God has rescued sinners, that, that in us as believers, Christ is being made complete, or we are being made complete in Christ. The, the mystery is this, that Christ is in you, Paul says, the hope of glory. And so as we preach the word of God, we are carrying out a stewardship given to us by God, but the revelation is not ours, it is God's revelation in Christ, which then leads us to another characteristic of this ministry, and that is that it is Christ-centered. We proclaim him, Paul says in verse 28. We proclaim Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. The word proclaim is in the present tense in the Greek, which means it's a continual action. Paul says we continually Preach Christ. And the reason he is making a point of that here in this context is because Gnosticism was something that was affecting the church in Colossae. And so he, he goes on in chapter 2 to talk about the mystery of God, which is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We do not need to look into other mysterious ways of gaining knowledge. Why? Because knowledge is in Christ himself. Christ is the very embodiment of truth and wisdom and knowledge. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that in Colossae, as in Corinth, intellectualism threatened to replace biblical faith. And then in his day, he said he observed that same trend in evangelicalism and he warned, quote, philosophy has always been the cause of the church going astray. For philosophy means ultimately a trusting to human reason and human understanding. So Paul is lifting up Christ. Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. If we want to shepherd our flocks well, if we want to counsel our flocks well, we must make sure it stays Christ-centered. He is the embodiment of wisdom. But there are also times, Paul says, that this ministry is corrective, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom. That word admonish means to correct through instruction and warning. But Paul didn't mean to be harsh about it or cruel. He was passionate for the development of Christ in believers. But he was gentle and filled with compassion. The same was true when he penned his strong admonition to the Corinthian church, which is the strongest letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. And in chapter 4, in verse 14, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Paul did not get strong in his teaching to shame believers, but to admonish them toward maturity in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we have this admonition, and we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. And so we see that not all believers are the same. Not all believers have the same need in the sense of our personal ministry to them. Some are unruly, and, and they need to be uh, admonished. Some are faint-hearted. That is, they, they regularly need encouragement. The word can mean small-souled or uh, 
despondent. And, and we are then to help those who are weak. Those who are spiritually and morally weak and need our help in walking with Christ and walking in a life of holiness and Christ-likeness. And then all need patience. All of us need patience. And all of the people in our church need us to be patient with them. The word patient is a compound word meaning long and tempered. And so it refers to us being long-tempered, not short-tempered, but long-tempered with the people in our congregation so that we will lead them according to the truth and the knowledge of Christ. This discipleship, this ministry, Paul goes on to say, is also theological. He said, admonishing every man and teaching every man. The word teaching means to give instruction. The noun form simply means doctrine. So this is referring to the carrying out of the great command in Matthew 28, that we would teach all of these things to all men. We're teaching the doctrine of Christ to all men. We need to be passing on the doctrine of Christ, the apostolic doctrine of the New Testament, to those whom God gives us to minister. And then this ministry is to be wise as opposed to foolish, obviously. He says, with all wisdom. We are to do this ministry of proclaiming Christ, correcting when necessary, teaching the doctrine of Christ with wisdom. This refers to the, the spirit or the atmosphere in which we teach. The word is related to goodness or to goodness itself and the wisdom that only good can possess. Now by choosing this word, Paul is making reference to the manner in which we carry out our discipleship ministry. In other words, Paul sought to always reflect the goodness of God in how he treated people. With grace and wisdom, even when he had to correct them. And then finally we see the purpose of authentic ministry, and that is that every man would be complete in Christ. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that, there's the purpose, so that we may present to every man complete in Christ. The word complete refers to having reached the goal. Trench says in synonyms of the New Testament that in a natural sense, this word teleoi refers to adults who have attained their full stature, strength, and mental powers. They have attained their telos, that is, their goal, maturity, to be distinguished from infants or young children. He goes on to say that the faithful Christian is to be perfect in the sense of striving by God's grace to be fully furnished and firmly established in the knowledge and practice of the things of God. Such perfection refers to to spiritual and moral maturity and is to be contrasted with the moral and spiritual condition of those who are babes in Christ. So the purpose of this ministry is that believers may be brought to completion in Christ, spiritual maturity. And then finally notice in verse 29, the perspiration of authentic ministry. That is, that this is hard work, that this is labor. Paul says it's for this purpose, the purpose I just explained in verse 28. That's why I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. This refers to intensive labor, 
to the point of weariness. So Paul worked himself to the point of fatigue. There are three qualities of his labor that are described here. It, it, it's intensive labor. That's what the word itself means. But he also says there, there's active Opposition, striving, he says, according to his power. Striving means to exert great effort and many times in the face of opposition. And then he says, this power is that which mightily works within me. Paul rested on divine enablement. This calling from God to shepherd people this way was too big for Paul. It's too big for me. It's too big for you. We cannot carry out this responsibility in our own strength. And so how, how encouraging it is then to know that, that the power of God is mightily working within us to carry out this responsibility, this stewardship to proclaim Christ, to nurture people in the word of Christ so that the Lord is glorified and his church is built up. Some plant, some water, but God causes the growth. And that should be so encouraging to us because the weight of shepherding is very, very heavy, but the empowerment is, is divine it is from god and so let us rest in god's empowerment to do that which he has called us to do to be faithful shepherds of his flock